we started in 2016. We are a community of people who loves talking about technologies. And uh, we started here at Impact Hub uh, organizing events. Uh, we had some talks with some guests. And we were like 30, 30 people at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, not so many. And uh, we grew up. We continued until today. And this is a picture from one of our last events. We were more than 300 people uh, at Auditorium uh, Let a lettere, lettere, yeah. yes. Uh, it was an event organized with the University of uh, Trento. And uh, we had the honor to host uh, Professor Tannenbaum. So it was a super event. We had a lot of people. And uh, usually after our event, we have a networking part where people talk to each other. Uh, you can talk with the speaker, uh, comment the event, uh, having a beer, drinking something, and also eating something. And um, we are not uh, only organizing this kind of event. From last year, we started two new branches from Spec and Tech. Uh, the first one is a Spec and Trek. So we organize trekking and hiking uh, around the mountains uh, here in Trentino. And uh, usually there is a speaker, and we stop at San Malga or Refugio, uh, eating something and talking about uh, uh, a specific topic. And uh, be ready for the next spec and track, which will happen in two Sundays, no, two Saturdays. Saturdays yeah. Two Saturdays, yes. And uh, we already have some info about the next speaker. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, gen um, generative AI. Art. Generative, uh, AI. Uh, and it's going to be like a great uh, talk, a great event. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Rifugio Valbiole, um, Parcheggio Valbiole, who is like next to uh, Molveno. Climb up to uh, Palon di Tovre, then come down, and we stop at a bar, at a, rest, uh, at a restaurant, and we have uh, an aperitivo talking about generative AI, the pros and cons, and the um, better closed source or open source. That's the main topic. I mean, of course, we can talk about other stuff, but that's uh, the main topic, and that's why we are going to have a guest talking about that. So go on our website or on, uh, um, on the... Uh, even bright page and you find all the details. We're going to publish in the next days anyway. So today is Spec and Tech, Spec and Tech number 54. A big applause. <laughs> the title of the event is Woodwork and uh, the first speaker of the night is Daniele Marinelli. <laughs> A big applause for him. From uh, Edmund Mach, Fondazione Edmund Mach in uh, uh, San Michele Ladige, maybe you know, is going to tell us a bit more later. Yes, and the second speaker is uh, Carlo Saporito Moretto <laughs> from Microtech. <laughs> a big applause also for him. Tonight's sponsor is Microtech. Uh, you will hear about them uh, in a while. Yeah, in a few minutes, I would say. So. Um, a couple of things just before moving on, very, very quick. Uh, after the event, especially for the newcomers, there's going to be spec and beers for everyone. Like a lot of spec and a lot of cold beers directly from the fridge. How can you support our events since they're free? You can get our merchandise. You see all of us wearing these t-shirts. Uh, you can find them at the entrance or you can also leave a donation. We have uh, stickers, we have swag, there's a bunch of stuff. You just can just contribute to the, to the community in any possible way, also via your phone, via credit card, whatever. We accept any way of payment. If you want to stay tuned on our events, there is our website where you can also become one of the next uh, speakers. We already have an event in July, we are going to tell you later on, by people that uh, were the first one to suggest us to give a talk. And also you find the job opportunities not only by the sponsors of the night and the company sponsor is Spec and Tech as well, but also uh, we, make, uh, we made a partnership with uh, Invest in Trentino that uh, make a cherry picking, uh, a very, very narrow selection of uh, tech job opportunities uh, in the area of Trentino from the companies that are based here that are looking, for example, for service automation engineers, field service engineer, computer vision engineers, so tech jobs uh, not really related maybe to coding or front-end developer, back-end develop developers, what you can imagine as the very, very basic uh, um, tech jobs. If you want to stay tuned, uh, on our social, the handle is easy, at Tech, 
And at the end of the event, we're going to send you a, a form telling us if you liked the event. How did you like it? If you liked the talks, the speakers, it was too hot. If the spec was too little, I doubt. Um, I think we are ready to start event number 54. If you've got questions for our speakers, slide.do slash spec54, or you just go to Slido and then insert the code spec54 to ask all the questions that you want to our two speakers that are starting now. So I would say, first speaker of the night, uh, Carlos Aprito Moretto, on stage. There was this fun moment where I was saying, first speaker of the night, and he was like, he's the guy, he's the guy. No, wait a second, he's the guy. Ready? Yes. Can okay. you hear me? Here's the slide. Thank you very much for being here. It's actually very good for me to be back in my hometown. I was born here about 35 years ago. Now I've been working at Microtech, a company based in Brixton, uh, since a couple of years. So Microtech is a company that was founded in 1980 by a visionaire, Mr. Federico Giudice Andrea, who is um, a passionate engineer uh, with a real fixation for the woodwork industry and for the customer that come from that industry. And about 43 years after that, Microtech has grown into a real global company that uh, has approximately uh, 100 million in revenue a year and more than 450 employees. And we are actually probably the only global provider of complete solutions for the woodwork industry, which is what really makes us unique. We are, as I was saying, more and more global. We have reached out to Sweden, Finland. In Italy, we have our headquarters in Brixen and another company in Mestre. We're in Germany as well. We, are, we have offices in Vancouver and in Corvallis, next to Portland on the west coast of the US. And our customer reach has grown with our locations so that we can now cover, as you can see, basically uh, most of the globe from our different locations. Microtech has a slogan, which is Innovating Wood, which is also the title of my presentation today. And the first question that I want to ask you, and I'm asking myself, is why bother innovating wood still? And there's several answers to that. I'm going to give at least a couple. So the first answer to why it matters to keep innovating wood today is because urbanization is happening, and it's happening fast globally. If we look at China alone from 1998 to 2018, so over just a period of 20 years, uh, the urban population there is nearly doubled and per capita timber consumption there has increased by as much as 70% over these 20 years. And if we look at the situation globally, urban dwellers are expected to increase by over 50% between 2020 and 2050. What does that mean? More people move from rural areas into the cities, new homes need to be built, and those homes add up to the stock of existing houses that ultimately get old and need to be renovated. So that also adds up to the timber consumption. So we got urbanization, which is the first factor, driving demand. And we have decarbonization as a second factor. As you know also, uh, well, countries worldwide have realized that climate change is happening and it's real and they have started taking action to counteract that and they try to decarbonize the economies you know how much the European Union is investing in that right so at least 600 billions that's the numbers we're talking about 600 billion euros just for renovating houses to reduce CO2 emissions just in Europe um, we have countries like France that are mandating by law that all public buildings starting 2022 will need to feature at least 50% sustainable materials, like wood. And what this is doing is um, it's driving a shift 
in the product mix, so to say, or in the construction mix, so in the materials that we use to construct the houses and to renovate the houses. And we're moving from non-timber-based products to timber frames and more and more towards a thing called CLT, which is cross-laminated timber, which is basically just layers of boards glued on top of one, an one another, which are extremely resistant and are extremely, uh, um, extremely sustainable. Actually, they have a net negative CO2 emission because during their life, trees actually capture and sequester much more CO2 than is actually required to process them in the production. And this is the reason why countries worldwide are actually turning towards this type of material and more and more towards wood to actually build sustainable houses. And we are estimating that at least 30% of the product mix that we're using today in construction will need to migrate from non-timber-based solution into timber-based solution. Long story short, timber consumption is increasing and it's expected to increase by at least 170% from 2020 to 2050. The obvious question is, do we have enough wood? Where is wood located, first of all? We got approximately a third of the wood in the world is in Europe and Scandinavia, another third is in North America, I would say, so United States and Canada, and the rest is split between Russia, South America, China, and Australia. Um, just briefly, um, there's mostly two types of wood. There is soft wood, which is like 80% of the wood around there. It's 80% of it because it, um, its seeds are not encapsulated, so it can reproduce much faster. And there's a, another 20% of wood, which is hardwood. The main difference between the two is the time it takes for the, each type of wood to grow to a state where they are mature enough to be harvested. This is incredibly important as a supply restraint, if you think about it. So there are trees that take approximately 20, 30 years before they are mature enough to be harvested, and trees that take up to 100, 150 years, like the trees in Russia. So this puts a constraint on demand. Um, so what, what experts expect that we can realistically achieve is a production of approximately 4.6 billion cubic meters of wood by 2050. Um, we are currently consuming about 3.7 billion cubic meters, but uh, the projections due to the timber consumption increase that I was telling you about before speak about approximately 6 to 7.5 billion cubic meters, so we're going to run short, long story short. And the least we can do is make the best of every single tree we cut. And I'm really saying the least we can do. And that is why innovating wood is so important even today, and that is why the work that Microtech does is so important today. Um, so what I want to do today is tell you about the journey of a tree from the forest until whatever it's, it's turned into as a final product. It could be furniture, it could be the floor, whatever. And I'm going to tell you how Microtech contributes to make sure that that tree is really turned, every single part of that tree is turned into something useful. So the journey of the tree starts from the forest where it's cut. There's basically two types of trees. There are long ones and there are short ones. Long ones reach up to 28 meters and are typical for North America and France. Shorter ones reach up to six meters. Um, they're transported to the mill where they will be processed. They are typically transported by truck, by river, or by uh, train. When they get there, that is the first time they meet Microtech products. So the first part they access in a sawmill is called log yard. It's literally a yard for logs, where the trees are, sorry, where the logs are basically stocked up before being analyzed to see if they're fit for processing. Now, before I dig into that, I just want to uh, show you uh, one slide which uh, is going to be useful as a kind of a dictionary for what I'm going to talk to you about shortly. So this is the section of a log, and what I'm going to tell you, like some words that you're going to hear through and through are 
the pith, which is the center of the, of the log. Um, we got the heartwood, which is the, the core part of the wood. It's basically a dead part, but it's also the hardest one and usually the most valuable. Then there is the more like the live part of the, of the log, which is the sapwood. You can see it's kind of like it has a brighter color. Then there is the bark, which is the external part, which is usually scrapped and turned into um, biofuel. Apologies for the colors here. The colors are not meant to actually represent good or bad features. Um, we will see that woods, wood simply has features that may be desirable or undesirable depending on the use that you want to do. But typical features of wood that we might be interested in finding out are things like bark enclosures. So basically uh, branches that have got stuck in the, in the wood during its evolution. We have shakes like this one, like uh, breakings in the log, and we have things like stains. Um, let me just go back real quick. So what happens when the log enters the log yard is there is a first uh, scanner that the log has to go through that simply determines whether the log is good enough to fit into the production line. Some logs are simply too big. And we typically do that with scanners that have like an infrared technology. Then there is another thing that happens almost all the time, which is wood needs to go through metal detectors. Some of you may have already guessed why that happens. So one of the number one cost components for a sawmill is the cost of the saws that cut the wood. And if there's any metal part in a log, you want to remove it. Otherwise, the saws may get damaged. So that is why it's important to have metal detectors there. You either have metal detectors or you have one of our scanners that can use X-ray technology to detect whether there are metal intrusions in the wood, like in this case, in this picture. And this can typically happen because uh, those metal pieces are somehow attached to the wood, and then as the wood grows, it kind of encapsulates them, and they're no longer visible to the human eye from the outside, right? Um, what our scanners do in this phase is they basically help with the measurement of the, of the log from the outside. Why is it important? Because the log is usually sold by, based on the size of the, of the diameter. You can either measure it with, with the log eye, that has like a 3D laser triangulation that allows you to basically reconstruct the log from the outside. And if you have X-ray technology, you can also use the density, you can also inspect the density of the material to inspect whether there are metal parts or whether there are knots in there. Or you can use a newer technology like the computer tomograph that we have, which is the CT log, which uses the exact same type of technology that you use in hospitals, right? When you, when you think about computer tomography, this is just a, tomog a tomograph for wood, for logs. So logs can go through the scanner that basically reconstruct the log in full 3D pictures that allow us to see inside the log and allow us to reconstruct every single thing that we can find into that log, all the features from the pith that we saw, which is the center of the tree, to all types of defects and other features of interest in the log. Why are these important? These are important because they, this information can be used to optimize the way how we can cut this log so that we can make the best of it. Where does the CT log also help? And this is the first time we actually meet artificial intelligence. Microtech is using artificial intelligence uh, in almost all its scanners. And this is the type of application that we have. Um, what you see here is artificial intelligence applied to the identification of the bark of the log, so the outer part, right? Why, why do we bother doing this? Because logs can be sold with or without the bark. If you sell it without the bark, it means you need to have a debarker. So basically, literally a machine, which is the log goes through and it cuts all the bark. But those machines are extremely expensive and they require a lot of maintenance. 
So customers may find it actually much more economical to just identify the position of the bark and the exact size of the log without the bark, even without removing the bark. That is where AI actually helps. This is an example of segmentation. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. And we can do this in full 3D. And we can tell you exactly how big the log is without debarking it. Now, what happens next is um, the wood, the log, moves into the saw line where it will be cut. Now, what happens here is there is another one of our scanners here it's called the log eye, who basically looks at the log after it has been debarked and checks how it should be rotated in an optimal way so that we can actually get the most out of it. And that happens together with, a, with an optimization process. This is mostly a mathematical optimization process, so there's no real artificial intelligence involved here. Um, what we do here is we determine visually, this is a basic, uh, a basic application of the knapsack problem, if you think about it. So this is so the problem of fitting as many items into, into a backpack, right? This is what we do here. We try to identify what is the best optimal cutting pattern for this log. And you can see that we identify a central cut that cuts for the hardwood, so the, the most valuable part. And we also identify some sideboards that are the least valuable cuts. But we try to do this in a way that maximizes the amount of the log that we use. Sorry, just stopping here for a while. It seems easy, it seems stupid, but it saves up to 30% of raw material. This is an example of what happens next. So this is a, an example where that kind of optimization doesn't happen, but we just need the, the raw, um, where we just cut simply the, the boards. In this case, the tree hasn't been debarked. It gets simply debarked by sewing machines that basically cut on the sides and remove and remove the, the edges. And another thing that happens afterwards is scanners determining the value of the wood by scanning the board after it has been after the edges have been removed. What happens next is a phase which is called green, dry and planar mill. I'm gonna be a little faster through this. So just to distinguish the three, so green here means the log right after the saw line without any additional treatment. So it's called green because it hasn't been dried yet. Um, what happens when we dry it? We put it into some storages where the, um, where the boards are basically subject to a ventilation system that basically dries it out until it has the desired properties. And what happens with green and also dry uh, boards is basically a similar process. They go through our scanners that look like these ones that you see in this picture. They are very broad scanners. And what they do is they try to determine which board belongs to which category, of based on the size, based on the type of wood, based on the quality level, and they get sorted. Um, in the case of green wood, one important thing that happens here is that we determine if the wood has the qualities that are necessary to actually fit into the drying rooms into that are called kiln. Because if they don't, they may actually uh, impair the quality of the rest of the wood that is in there. And here you see uh, one of those facilities where the wood get, uh, gets eventually dried. And after the drying procedure, it needs to be scanned again so that the qualities of the wood can be controlled again. Now, I talked to you about the scanners, but there's actually more behind this. There, We have instruments that actually control the curvature of the board, instruments that control the level of moisture of the board, uh, that control the density of the board. And we're going to talk about why this is important. What happens next is the last phase, which is called secondary processing, which is where our one of our uh, best products actually takes uh, finds its place, which is called the golden eye. Here, what you see is uh, two families of scanners. One is GoldenEye, which is the green one, and the other one is WoodEye, which is the, 
the black one, what they do is basically a similar activities on, on different types of wood. One, the golden eye is focused on softwood, the other one is focused on hardwood. What they do is they scan the boards at a very high speed. You can see here the speed is between 150 meters per minute up to 1,200 per minute. So that's a really high speed. We're going to see why that is important. They scan the boards at very high speed and try to determine whether there are any defects in those boards and what the real quality, what the real value of those boards is, so that it can eventually optimize what happens next in a way that we can really make the best of that board. Now, the process boards ultimately end up in, um, they may be subject to further processing. I won't go through the details here, but ultimately they end up generating the final products that you know so well, like parkades or sauna floors, if you've ever been to a sauna, or cabinets and all sorts of furniture. Here you have an example where one of our scanner is on the line and it's the one on the right side. The board goes through it and it determines the best way for the next machine to cut it, to cross cut it in this sense. So it basically cuts it into smaller pieces. But the importance of that scanner is that it tells the other machine how to cut it in a way that we can spare as much raw material as possible. Another type of secondary processing is this one, which is molding, which, I mean, we have companies also in South Tyrol doing this. Um, there is a machine that basically makes the profile that you know, you, you may have lots of these also in your houses. Um, so what is the real power of our scanners? How do they work? How do they det detect the defects? How do, they det how do they come to detect the quality of a board? Well, artificial intelligence plays a big role there. Microtech has been pioneering this since 1999, I think, uh, even before. And uh, we use this to solve mainly three categories of problems. One of them is segmentation, which is identifying polygons in pictures. Um, another example is classification. So given a set of images, we try to classify them. We try to distinguish which image belongs to which class. And then we have regression. And a typical example of that we're going to see is the geolocation of the pith in a board. And we'll see why it's important. Here's an example of segmentation. So what you see here is a board on the top, which is the real board. And what you see underneath is a board where the AI has basically been able to identify all the shades, or the stains, sorry. And you can see all the white areas here have been uh, identified with a very high precision. Here you have an example of classification. So for those of you who are familiar with computer vision, you probably know that this is a very typical example of usage for computer vision, right? So um, just the back story of it. So uh, a sawmill doesn't just have scanners, but they also have people that visually inspect the boards and they use crayon marks to basically uh, mark the quality of each board so that uh, the machines, like, like our scanners, then know how these boards should be sorted in the production line. So which one should be sent one way or another. And where AI plays an important role here is in the recognition of these uh, crayon marks. Looks like an easy task, but trust me, there are a lot of things that play here, like the position of the crayon marks, or, you know, it's like trying to identify writings, right? People are not always precise in the way they, they put those markings, especially because this happens in the line, right? In the production line, nonstop. Um, the last example is regression. So what you see here is how AI can be used to identify the geolocation of the pith, so of the center of the log, with respect to the board. So if you think about the cutting pattern that we saw before, where we have the central cut and the cuts and the side boards in the log, what this is telling us is where the side boards are with respect to the center of the log. Why is this important? Because it affects the value of the log. There are actually countries regulating the price of the wood based on the distance of the board from the pith. 
and we can achieve this at very high speed with precision below one millimeter. Now, what affects the performance of AI? Um, there are several factors. Like in any sort of data analysis that you will do, the first one is the quality of the data. So in this case, the quality of the images, which is where it typically makes a difference to have good hardware supporting your scanner. Then we have the training. So we're basically the labeling of the images, meaning an algorithm is only as good as the training data you give it. So you need a, tr a team of people. We have one of, one of these people here, actually, who has come all the way from Florence today. And what they do is they bring their knowledge of trees to actually visually inspect the boards and mark the different defects and features of the wood. And they pre-train the data, so to say. Speed is another important factor. Remember, we're talking about scanners that work with a speed of up to 1,200 meters per second, sorry, per minute. Uh, and a type of wood, different types of wood. As you see here, there's uh, plenty, plenty of types. Each has a different patterns, right? In the, in the veins of the wood. And not only the type of wood, but also the level of moisture, because it can also impact what we see in the images. This is where Microtech is, is leading right now, because we have superior hardware, like our cameras, that can produce high quality pictures at very high speed, and they can produce up to 600 frames per second. We have our, sorry, we have our own photodiode arrays for X-ray scanners that can take up to 6,000 frames per second. So imagine what level of definition the image this can give you and why this is important for, for, the, for the performance of our AI algorithms. Um, and before concluding, um, I want to tell you about one more thing that we do. We don't just scan the wood along its way. We don't just produce high quality images and detect all defects and features of the wood, but we are also able, based on these high quality uh, images of our wood, to basically create a digital fingerprint of each single board that allows the sawmills to basically identify the whole journey of each board from the log up until the very end of the, um, of the journey. And I would like to show you a quick video, if it's possible. Can we? Yeah. Yes. Sort of a bit there. And I swear this is gonna be much better than having to listen to me for 30 minutes.
as little fuel as possible. Here you see the log gets scanned again and gets recognized based on its features. And it gets verified again, especially after debarking, this is very important. Because the, the wood has moved along along the conveyor belt, so it may have moved from its original position. So our scanners can tell whether it needs to be rotated so that the cutting pattern can actually be followed by the sewing machine. This is actually very, very important. So this is the cant, so the wood after it has been cut in a kind of like more square fashion. our optimizer again, trying to make sure that we really make the best of every single tree. This is a generation of the fingerprint based on the features of each board even before it's cut. This is simply based on the very high resolution images that we can produce with our scanners. And this is the green mill, dry mill, planar part that we were talking about before where they go through this Transversal scanners. And each board is recognized again. It seems banal, but sawmills actually process thousands and thousands of boards, so this is actually very important for them. And if there's any lot of boards that was defective, then you can kind of identify all of them because you, you, because you can trace them all back to the same log. This is especially important if you see that there are features like fungi uh, deteriorating the quality of the, of the wood, especially before drying it up. And here you see that we really can trace it back, trace each board back to the initial log. This is basically the summary of what I, what I was telling you before, and maybe just to conclude, how does Microtech achieve all this? Um, I want to be brutally honest here. Uh, Microtech has one slogan, which is innovating wood, but trust me, like innovation is really at the heart of what Microtech does. There's basically two things at the heart of what Microtech does. There's innovation and there's dedication to the customers. It sounds like banal, it sounds like a marketing thing to say, but trust me, this is actually true. If you come at Microtech, and please come, even just to visit us, even just to see our, how our scanners work, we have a beautiful showroom where we, can, where we would be happy to show you how our scanners work. Come and feel what being in an innovative, in an innovative company really means. You will be surrounded by very smart people with great ideas, working together with universities, uh, with research centers, and working together with our customers to bring newer and newer solutions every day. What this means in the workplace is new challenges every day, but if you're up for a challenge, I think this might be the right place. And the good thing about this is you will never feel alone because innovation is really something pervasive that is shared by all employees and you will not really feel like you're doing something alone. If you have a good idea, you will feel like you have an army behind you. And this is, I think, what I really love about Microtech. That's what I wanted to say today. Yeah, it's just this. Yes, sir. All right. Whoa. <laughs> Got it. Okay, a few questions for you. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It was extremely interesting, especially for somebody that just uh, uses the wood to put it into the fornazella. Um, <laughs> first question. Um, um, I found it an interesting one. Um, What's, um, come mai avete fatto ricorso ad array di fotodiodi prodotti da voi? Le soluzioni esistenti sono solo di classe medicale scientifica, quindi troppo costosi? 
Uh, shall I translate in English? Uh, why did you use the photodiodes uh, yeah. by your, your own and you built your own instead of using the, uh, the ones that are out there on the market? Should I answer in Italian or in English? Uh, if you're fine with English, go for it. Okay. So one thing I don't know right now, because I'm just too young to know the answer. Remember, Microtech has been there for 43 years. I'm not that old. Um, my first question would be, did those exist before, like, like, did they exist with the necessary quality before we actually needed them? That is one, one question I would ask in return. And the other is definitely having them made by us ensures that we can fine tune them in a, best, in a way that ensures the best performance for our scanners. And maintain them, yeah. Absolutely. And obviously also reduce the cost for us. Why not? Yeah. You, you don't resell your hardware or your solutions? Uh, not that I know, no. Sorry. But you're opening an interesting <laughs> avenue. I mean, what's the percentage of the log that is turned in boards uh, vs uh, biofuels? Sorry, what is the percentage of what? O of log, log that is turned into boards, uh, slices, rather than uh, biofuels? Uh, I don't know very precisely. Uh, I guess it depends on it depends on on the sawmill, obviously, because some of them don't even some of them don't even debark the wood. So some of them just sell it with the whole bark. So in that case, it's zero percent. Um, I don't have a I don't have a number in mind for that. Oh, right. but it's uh, it's a minor part actually. You can add it to the slides and then yes, we put it yes. on the website. Of course, I'll provide it. <laughs> Do, does the fingerprint work after drying? The locks do oh, not sorry. change. Sorry, one, one thing I can tell you, okay. though, is uh, that there is approximately a 15% of the whole timber in the world that ends up in biofuel generation. 50? 15, yes. 15. Okay. And another, so 75% of the wood is used in the construction sector, uh, 15 in... Um, in uh, biofuels. Biofuels. There's another 10 in... Uh, um, what's it called? Uh, pulp. Pulp and paper. Can you pulp, pulp wood, like oh, paper, wood. like ah, okay, got it. Uh, okay, minced. Yeah, it's it's used for paper production. Okay, mostly. Yeah. Another question: Does the fingerprint work after drying? The logs do not change too much. Um, actually, not depends, but mostly not. No, that but that is what that is one of the, that is a very interesting question because it makes actually our fingerprinting solutions quite uh, important because they actually succeed even after the drying. But uh, that's, a very, that's a very important point, actually. Yeah. Okay. This is why you need scanners like these yeah. that are quite expensive, but they actually do the job even after the condition of the wood. The various actually. processes, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, how much does your system cost for one customer, say, average cost? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on, no, it really depends on the application, depends on the scanner. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to, am I allowed? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I didn't, I didn't mention, but it's actually very important. Um, I have a wonderful colleague here with me today, which is Cecilia Valentini. She's sitting in the front row. And you should go ask her all the dif difficult questions, right? She, she's not here just to ensure that I don't say BS to you, but she is also here because, uh, first of all, she's been at Mikotech, uh longer than I have, and she knows it better than I do, and she knows all the positions we have. So in case any one of you is interested in joining, she'll be the right Got partner. It. You mentioned all the continents, but Africa. Is the African continent really an interesting in the wood market, or is it because of the type of wood that is out there? Uh, did I mention Africa? No. Yeah, it wasn't uh, on the slide. Yeah, yeah, it's on the slide, but yeah, it doesn't have a major wood production. Or yeah. maybe it's soft uh, versus hard wood. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't currently contribute to most of the wood production in the world. Like I was saying before, like a third is in is located in Europe and Scandinavia, and another third in U.S. and Canada, and the rest is spread between Russia with a 15% share almost than South America and Asia. Africa is currently not really an interesting market that I know. Okay. Not that I know. Okay. Not for wood production. I, is classification used only to recognize crayon marks or also other use cases? 
classification. Yeah, like uh, that is the most important um, application we do right now that I can think of. Um, yes, it is. The, it is the the main application we do for sure. So mostly uh, recognizing signs on the yes. on the pieces of wood. I'm trying to think about it. A could also be used in uh, grading, I think, in trying to understand. Uh, now, nah, now that it's no, nah, again, no. Yeah, it's but it's mostly used there in grade mark readers, so to say. They're called grade mark readers. Those okay. Applications. Okay. Yeah. Gonna mm, final question: What is the split of uh, hardware vs software people in your company? Mm, we definitely have more software people. Uh, Definitely. Like, I think in operations alone, we have how many? Like 50? Probably more. Um, but almost everyone, I, I think, actually, I'm probably one of the least tech guy there. Really? But <laughs> almost everyone can code. Okay. Me too. But, uh, like, almost all of us can can program. And I would say, yeah, most of them are definitely software developers. Even project managers often have a background of being software engineers, and this is also what something that I think is nice. You can actually evolve through different roles and see the whole the whole picture. Clear. Okay. For any other question, just ask uh, Carlo later on, uh, or Cecilia, of course. There's uh, a table full of uh, swag and branding over there, out there, so just go and get them and talk them later on uh, in front of a beer. We move over to the second uh, speaker of the night, but first, uh, a little break for a few information. Thanks again, Carlo. Thank you. Okay, before moving on to the second part of the event, uh, a couple of information. First, uh, uh, we, we prepared a REST store chairs API uh, guide to tell you how to disassemble these uh, chairs at the end of the evening. So as soon as we finish with the second uh, uh, talk, we will tell you how to sort this place out because we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, spec and beers for all of you. Um, a very important information, uh, the, you should return the beers. You don't take it home because, uh, uh, I mean, we, 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 we get paid for the beers extra when we return the whole uh, basket full of beers and not of empty bottles. So please leave them here when you finish them. Two information before moving on. First, uh, the next event, we know it's July, we know it's summer, but we are going to have an event also in July and on the 17th, and we're going to be talking about uh, front-end development, so a very tech event. Uh, there's going to be two speakers. One of them is coming even from uh, Switzerland, uh, Austria, Austria, so you might better be there. And uh, the, la the other information is uh, that we're going to have our V4 of the retreat, so our main event, there is going to be from the 6th till the 8th uh, of October, so the first weekend of October, and we're going to go in the Alps, in the middle of the Val di Sole, and it's going to be amazing. So I we're going to share later information in the upcoming days. Uh, it's going to be a real fun, a uh, whole weekend full of uh, outdoor spa, uh, food, talks, uh, companies, etc. It's going to be real good. We're going to send it out more information very soon. Second speaker of the night, Daniele Marinelli, on stage. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for, getting, for having me here. Uh, great presentation for Microtech. Don't know if I will be able to beat it, but let's try to it. And uh, I'm a researcher, so at Fondazione Dunmach. Fondazione is a foundation which has three main objectives: uh, education to both uh, a high school student and a university student, a tr technological transfer from the foundation, for example, to farmers, and research, which is where I come from, and at the Center for re Research and Innovation focus both on like on different very different application ranging from uh, uh, water to environmental monitoring to biodiversity and specifically i come from the uh, forest ecology unit in which as the name says we focus mainly on forest 
And as the first presentation told us, uh, it's very important that the woods get to the meal in a safe way. So that's what we try to do to understand and to monitor the health of our forest. So as you may all know, uh, climate change is doing a bit of bad stuff around the world right now. So I will not bore you with all the data about temperature rising and whatever. Uh, I just wanted to give you some number regarding how important forests are for our world and also for Trentino itself. And here I have some numbers in terms of like a uh, number of trees, the number of hectares that covers the world in terms of forest. Obviously these are all estimates, don't take them as like the perfect numbers. But I just want you to focus attention on these two numbers. So the number of uh, carbon that is stored in forest right now and the number of carbon that we produce as humans every day. And as you can see, the order of magnitude is quite, clo is quite close. So what we understand from this is that forest can really play an important role in offsetting the carbon emission that we uh, emit every year and we will likely increase in emitting in the next years. What if you look at Trentino, so the region in which every one of us live more or less. So again, in Trentino forests are very important as you may have seen, like everywhere you look around, forests are everywhere, also around in here in Trento. And uh, like forests are important from an environmental point of view, so for the habitat of our animals, from a community point of view. So for everyone who was born here in Trentino, like me, like forests are a key part of where you grow up. You grow up in the forest, in the mountains. Forests are important for timber production, obviously, and in Trentino also for tourism. So. They are, play a key role, both from a social point of view and from an economical point of view. So I think that it's very clear that we should keep an eye on forest. And actually, forests have increased in Trentino in the last years. But some, something, bad really, something really bad happened uh, in 2018. This was via forest. This is a picture I took like two weeks after the, the via event near Lago di Caressa in, uh, in Sutirol. And the, this really uh, affected the extension of forest in Trentino. So here we have some data like VIA damaged almost 20,000 hectares. And now we have another challenge that is coming up in the last years, which is bark beetle attacks or Bostrico. And if you like did some hikes in the last year in the uh, forest of Trentino or to Adige or even Veneto, you may have seen all these specks of uh, uh, red forest, which are dead trees or dying trees that have been attacked by this little insect that burrows inside the barks until killing the, the trees. So if, you su if we sum Want to call see? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we sum like the, the number of factors damage by via and by barbitol, we have like around 7% of our forest areas in Trentino damaged by barbitol, which is basically means that one every 15 trees have been damaged by Okay. Okay, so basically one every 15 trees have been damaged by via or either uh, bark beetle. So the main point here is that it's really important to monitor forest both locally at the local level and also at the global level. So locally to preserve the resources in terms of social resources and economical resources and globally in terms of uh, carbon emission and the carbon uh, offset. So how we can do it? And that's what we do at the Forest Ecology Unit. Basically, we have different way of we can, which we can w monitor our forest, and we did a different scale. We do with sensor mounted directly on the trees. We do with towers, which measure different kind of aspect from above of the trees. And then, if we need to scale up a bit of our measurement, we do it with uh, drones and helicopters. And uh, most importantly, in terms of like monitoring from above with satellites. So the aim of this presentation will be to give you, let's say, an overview of these three different technologies, starting with the, the sensor, which are um, called tree talkers. So they actually talk with the trees. 
and uh, they've been developed by an Italian company, and uh, an Italian startup actually, and we uh, as FEM help them in like uh, calibrating and validating the, the sensor. So basically, as you can see, there are uh, some little devices that are mounted uh, on, the, on the tree bark, with sometimes with some solar panel for, uh, for energy, obviously. And uh, the, obviously we mount one for each tree, and then there may be like a network of sensors mounted inside that single forest, and they are communicating between, between each other. So the sensor has inside multiple, the, the tree talker inside of it has multiple sensors, ranging from a spectrometer that looks up in the forest and try to analyze the, the different wavelengths coming up from the, from the skies, from the sun, in terms of which uh, wavelengths are transmitted by the vegetation and which wavelengths are blocked by the vegetation. We have the, an infrared sensor that measures the distance between the, bark, the tree talker and the bark, which tells us the radial growth of the trees. We have a, a sensor for subflow, so how much sub is being pumped up by the tree to the upper vegetation. We have obviously a wireless antenna for communication, and then we have other sensors like accelerometer to check the tree stability, a thermo, so basically a thermostat for temperature, and then a connector for the solar panel or even batteries. So just to give you an overview of the different uh, stuff that we can measure, this one is our uh, measure from the, the spectrometer. So here we have like uh, 12 spectral channels measured in different wavelengths of the spectrum. And uh, here you can see the different measurement in a different vegetative season. So when the value goes up, it means that the tree is in a, is in a vegetative state, so it's basically spring or summer, and is actually having a, a leaf on condition. So maybe in the case of broadleaf, you have leaf on the trees. You can see that it's quite noisy. This is just because in the way of which you orient the, the sensor, the way in which you position the sensor, and the way in which the, the vegetation moves can really affect the, the measurement. But the trend is clear, so you can really measure when the, the trees start producing vegetation and when the vegetation season ends. We then have the measurement for, uh, for subflow. This is a bit more complicated. So here you have say, two probes that are inserted into trees. One probe is like a reference and is not heated, whereas the other one, the upper one, is heated. And so here what it does, it basically measures the differential of temperature between the two points, which depends on how fast the flows, the sub flows across the two, two, to, to, uh, the two uh, probes. And this will tell us, basically using a simple equation, how much flows is flowing. And obviously, again, this is a good indication of the health status of the trees. And here you can see the measurement performing across a period of more or less uh, 20 days. We then have like uh, another parameter which is correlated still with the air status of the trees or how much the trees can actually grow effectively. And uh, here we have a comparison between uh, a five sensor mounted on a, a fagus, which is basically a, a beach in terms of species, and uh, a picea, which is uh, a, a spruce, an average spruce, or a beta rosso in, in Italian, and this is faggio in Italian. And again, you can see that over a course of a year, you can really accurately measure how much the tree is growing. Again, the, the, the measurements are not perfect, but you can, you can get really a nice, a nice trend. And another thing is that you can really see the, the winter season, where you have a flat, so you don't have any growth, and the vegetative season in which actually the tree is, uh, is growing. So, as I said, we don't have an, an individual sensor, we have multiple sensors mounted in the forest that they communicate between each other, and they have, like, let's say, a, a main sensor that will then transmit it to, to a server from which our researchers can download it and can analyze the, the data. Moving on, uh, we have another scale from which we can perform the measurement, which is, uh, like, from, from these towers. If, we, if you do some hiking in Trentino, you may have seen them, there is one in uh, Viotta, which is actually not a tower, but is a similar uh, measurement uh, station. So let's now focus a bit on this one. And uh, on top of this tower, we have very different sensors from eddy convergence station to phenocams. So these are basically like a camera which are focused on monitoring the phenology of the vegetation, so the cycle of the vegetation during the year, and other spectral measurement. These two are a bit more common, let's say, measurement. I will focus a bit more on this one, which is at the covariance station. And basically, what it does 
it has a um, anemometer, which is not like the classical one where you have the little thing spinning, but you have actually an ultrasonic anemometer that measures the speed of wind in the x, y, z direction. And then you have an infrared gas analyzer. So with this instrument, you can measure the direction of the wind and the, uh, which type of gas and which amount of gas is flowing, and then ob obviously in which kind of direction. So with this kind of uh, sensor, you can measure the flux of carbon between the atmosphere, so to understand if there is an emission from the forest to the atmosphere, or if there is an absorption from the forest, from the atmosphere to the forest. So obviously, the, the good thing is this one, the bad thing is this one. And uh, we can install this uh, sensor in diff very different environment, from vineyard to grassland. Again, in the Oste, there is a si very a similar sensor to this one, to, to forest, obviously. And uh, this tower, especially in the case of forest, need to be uh, positioned in a very specific uh, position, which we'll see later. But this is an, an example of what we can measure with the, with the sensor, which is basically a time series from 20, uh, 23, uh, 2003 to 2020 that shows for each year, each year you see it from 1 to 36 to 360. So it shows the carbon flux between the vegetation and the, and the atmosphere from uh, and, and to during the entire day, in which in, uh, in blue you see the period of absorption from the forest, and in the red or yellow you see the period of uh, emission from the forest. So you have absorption, absorption during the day, so when the forest performs photosynthesis, and you have emission during the night, uh, basically when the forest is not performing photosynthesis. So it's just basically the breathing cycle of the, of the vegetation. But as you can see here, we have uh, like, obviously this is a com very compressed visualization, but we have very detailed, uh, uh, and a very detailed idea of what happens for every day of the year, every hour of the year. As I said, you need to position this uh, uh, tower in a very specific, uh, in a, at a very high height, especially when you have very high trees. So this is one of my colleagues, I think this is Mauro Cavagna, going up uh, in the, the trees. And um, so basically, this one in, is in Lavarone. We have something very similar to this tower in Val di Sembra. So we have basically it's a very uh, narrow aluminum frame, 40 meters high, more or less. And uh, to give an idea from what you can see from, uh, from below, here is uh, just a short, a short video. So as you can see, it's very narrow. It's nothing uh, big because it is like, a very little bit on, on the ground, and then there's some cable holding up the towers. And on top, you can see my colleague climbing down from, from, the, from the tower. And basically, this, uh, uh, this is basically maintenance to the sensor to check if everything goes okay, to install new sensor, or to remove older, older sensor. Yeah, I got scared because of the height, so I was not feeling comfortable. Cento mega di presentazione, quindi. So a very interesting thing of this system is that we don't have one, we don't have two, we have like many around the world, these are not all ours. Uh, basically there is, a, there is a network of research center that are uh, uh, positioning this sensor all around the world from quite a lot of time ago. So as you can see like the uh, dark red dots, there are many, especially in the northern hemisphere, 
So we have, we have very accurate measurement about carbon flux between very different kind of forests and different ecosystems from uh, more than 20 years and also now start appearing much more in like developing countries and so on. So this gives the researcher very long time series to analyze and to correlate between, for example, like climate change variates and uh, temperature variables. Moving on now to the uh, from above technology, which is remote sensing. So basically here, what you do is to use a sensor which are mounted on more on different platforms, such as drone, helicopter, and the most common uh, case of remote sensing, especially for forestry uh, and very other application are satellites. So what I would like to do now is like to give you an overview of the different data that we can use, that we are actually using, how we elaborate this data, and how we can access this data, because it's getting harder and harder as we, as we move on. Or easier, it depends on the way you look at it. So one of the ma uh, very common data that we use for forestry monitoring are LiDAR. You may have seen LiDAR if you've seen any kind of video of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, automotive cars, automatic uh, dr uh, driving cars, where they are using this sensor to, let's say, look at the surrounding. So basically, they are based on a, a laser that emits uh, pulses measuring the distance between the object and the sensor itself in very dif in different direction. So it performs this operation uh, a large number of amount of time, up to like say 150,000 times per second. So what you get, you don't get an image with respect, which uh, for example with other similar sensor, but you get a point cloud which represents the three-dimensional structure of the object or of the scene you're observing. And in the case of forest, you get a very accurate representation of the forest at individual tree level. Another uh, class of sensors that we use are uh, uh, spectral imaging. So to just give you an idea, this is uh, in concept a technology similar to the one that we've seen for the spectrometer of the Tutarkar. You have your sunlight. And typically, what our eyes does uh, do or a photo camera do we basically measure the three spectral channels that we call colors, which are red, green, and blue. And if we look at the healthy trees, we will see, for example, most of the emission in the green channel. So we, we will perceive the trees as green. But if the health status of the trees change, of the vegetation change, it may get yellow, for example, or even if you take, for example, a plant, you don't water it for like two weeks, the plant will get yellow and then it will change the way it reflects light. So we will perceive it as yellow or orange. And what a satellite does and a spectral imaging sensor does is that it measures this reflection in the different wavelength, but on, not only in the visible, so what we perceive as humans, but also in the other portion of the spectrum, for example, as, uh, such as uh, infrared, and this allows us to perceive a var variation in the health status in the status of the vegetation that are not visible with the naked eye. So to sum up, basically your classical RGB image will have for each pixel three value RGB. So you're actually performing, let's say, a sampling of the spectrum, which represents the way spectrum is the, the spectral signature is the way that an object reflects the light. We can have multispectral image in which we may have like more than three channels, four up to 10, 12 channels, in which are actually instead performing a sampling not only in the visible range of the spectrum, but also in the, for example, in the infrared range of the spectrum. And then you have like the extreme of this uh, technology, which are hyperspectral images, in which for one pixel you may have uh, 200 values. So you're actually performing a very detailed sampling of the spectral signature across the entire uh, spectrum of interest. For, so for example, here from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. So with this kind of uh, sensor, you can really measure in detail how the vegetation, how the trees is reflecting the, the lights. So what if we have this kind of data? We have maybe, for example, hyperspectral data and uh, LiDAR data, both acquired from uh, um, a neighbor sensor. So you have your aerial image, here we have like an, an RGB visualization. And what you have, what we do basically, is that we develop the algorithm, the, the software, that automatically process this data with basically computer vision software. So what we do is that, for example, we apply a segmentation algorithm applied to the LiDAR data to identify the individual trees, 
you can do this at the level of uh, uh, one small area, but you can do up the level of Trentino, for example, if you have an acquisition over Trentino, because, for example, the province of Trento performed this acquisition more or less every five to ten years. You can then use this information to estimate the height, the height of individual trees, not only the height, but, for example, the biomass, the amount of volume, of tree vo uh, uh, timber volume contained. And then you can actually also classify the species, because different trees, different tree species reflect the light in different way. So by fusing the information coming from the three-dimensional structure of the light and the spectral information from the hyperspectral sensor, you can identify the different tree species. And again, you can do this at the tree level, at the regional level, but also at the national level. So there are many countries, like for example, the northern countries of Europe or Canada, that are performing this kind of operation on very large, at, at, the, at very large scale. Another thing that you can do is use uh, multi-temporal data. You, know, you don't have an, a single acquisition, you have multiple acquisitions in time, and so you can use this kind of information to measure how much carbon the, the forest is capable of, of, uh, of stocking, and how much this um, carbon stock varies over time. So, for example, if you have uh, an area where you have a cut, for example, to build a new road, obviously you will have a loss of carbon stock capacity, whereas other areas in which the forest was uh, capable of growing in a healthy status, you have an increase of um, carbon absorption capabilities. But again, these are just some of the applications that we are developing. I don't want to bore you with all the different applications. And uh, here, the, the really important part that we do is to try to link the physical phenomenon that is happening on the ground, so trees growing and so on, with the, uh, let's say, remote sensing data, to, so to try to understand what we can see from the remote sensing data. Another thing is uh, we talk about VIA at the beginning of the presentation, is to try to estimate how much damage was, uh, VIA did. So here we have a, a satellite image from uh, in the area of Predasto before VIA, and this is a satellite image after VIA. So as you can see, the damage are quite uh, extensive, and here what was uh, uh, required to us was to develop an algorithm to detect automatically all the areas that have been affected by the deforestation to estimate damage and, and so on. But now I would like to move a bit away from the specific application of forestry and to try to understand how we can access this, this data, especially in the case of uh, satellite data. Because in the case of uh, like uh, uh, urban data, typically a company acquires them and then send them, send them directly to us. But in the case of uh, satellite data, you have, in most of the cases, a space agency, so like NASA and ESA, and nowadays you have also a company like uh, Planet and, and so on that acquired the data. But what happened in the 90s and early 2000s, so not so many years ago, what you would need to do was to search for your data on the database of the, of the satellite, which was mainly from, uh, no, which act was actually only from NASA or ESA mainly, you will need then to pay for each image, where the cost will be like for, from 400 to 4,000 images, depending on if the uh, agency sold you the data as a public agency or as a private or commercial, soft, uh, commercial license. Then you will need to ask them to the company, which will put them physically on a CD or even magnetic tape before actually uh, CDs. Magnetic tape was probably until the 90s, so I don't actually remember what was happening there and they will sh physically ship them to you. And then you will need to actually process the data, hoping that the data was the correct quality, there was not too much cloud cover, and so on. So as you may see, what you will get in those kind of period was that if, for example, you did a PhD, you will get one data, and that was it. That was something that you, need, you had to work through your entire PhD, because the process of obtaining one was extremely costly from the time and the economical point of view. But what happened is that technology is improved, like now we have internet, we have very fast bandwidth, but most importantly, the space agencies understood that the value is not in the, in the data, but it is in the information you can extract from the data. So nowadays, what you have is basically this, so you can switch and forth between accessing the data and processing the data. To give an example, this is the access to Landsat data. So Landsat is a constellation of satellites from the American Space Agencies, which is basically the first remote sensing satellite which was launched in the, in the, in the 70s. And you can see that only after 
a Talansat archive was made uh, like in an open access policies, the number of access to the data and the number of paper published with this data really dramatically increased. And that really changed everything. This was in 2008, so not so many years ago. It really changed every everything because for the first time, everyone from America to Africa to Asia was able to access freely uh, this uh, very important data covering the entire time series from the 70s up to today. So what is happening right now is that we are transitioning to like cases in which we have few images, so you may be able to basically just detect changes, the basic for, for example, via, to a monitoring. For actual monitoring, you have cont constant images acquired multiple times a year, and so you have to actually perform a monitoring in time and in space at a very accurate level. The second evolution was made by the European Spa Space Agency with the Sentinel, the Sentinel constellation. These are the Sentinel-2 constellation, which are two uh, satellites with a multispectral sensor mounted on board. And you can see that basically, you will see that in five days, they perform an entire scan of the Earth's surface. And if we focus on uh, uh, Europe, because these uh, satellites are targeted mainly over Europe, you get an image, for example, of Trentino every more or less three days. So you can imagine that now you have a very uh, dense time series, you have a very dense monitoring of the Earth's surface at a resolution of more or less 10 meters. And what you get from like the two images before and after via that we've seen before is something like, like this, which is not a forest, obviously, but I thought it was too cool to, to avoid to put it in presentation. This is a sheep breaking yard in India. It is where basically they beach the sheep and uh, they disassemble them. And uh, this is a time series covering three years in which you can actually see, basically it seems like humans eating sheep, basically, because you can see them here, for example. And this gives you, and this has like a lot of, of less images than would actually be possible, just because maybe there was clouds or the images was not, there was cloud hail. So I just selected only the, the most beautiful images. And uh, this took me like probably three minutes to make because you just have an online tool. So it really changed the way we can uh, really access now the data. Just after, I mean, when I did my PhD in 2015, it was not possible to do something like this. So in like five to eight years, everything really, really changed. But moving back a bit to the, to the forest, this is a similar time series that we see, but for, uh, for bark beetle. This is an area near Predasto, and it has, has a time series from 2020 to 2022, in which you can actually see, if you pay a bit of attention, like the bark beetle expanding through this direction. So here, instead, you can see uh, some spectral indexes that we computed from the images, basically by computing ratio ratios of the, of the spectral channels, in which you can clearly see, like for example, the phenology of the grass here, Obviously, when you go in winter, you have a lower humidity level, but then you will see that the, all of this area will get red because it means that the trees are, are dying. And so what you can do, we do here is that we have this kind of constellation of satellites, Sentinel, Landsat, Planet, and so we don't have one image per year, we have multiple images per year, and so you can use this to check for the vegetation. So for each pixel, we can check uh, what is the health status of the vegetation. We go from, it's okay, Again, okay, and then we see that something is going on. So the tra temporal trajectory of the spectral signature is changing from uh, a healthy to something that represents uh, a tree that is not in a healthy status, which may be, for example, uh, being attacked by, uh, by, by a bark beetle. So we can actually perform this mapping every three to five days over the entire of Trentino, but we can scale up, obviously, to, to the Alps or even, or even larger. And indeed, the problem now is that we may have too many data. So if you consider, for example, only the Sentinel constellation, which are two satellites, but there is actually maybe the planet constellation, which is composed by, it, uh, it's a, co a private constellation, which is composed by more or less 200 satellites, where you have images daily at three meters spatial resolution, but those are, uh, th they are, let's say, you have to pay for them. Instead, these are, are completely free, so you have everyone can access them. So only for Trentino, uh, you have more or less from, uh, let's say, from the 2017, you have more or less 2,500 images that you need to process, which roughly correspond to five terabytes. 
which is not a huge amount of data, but there are a huge amount of images. So it's very, uh, you really need to understand how you can process, process them efficiently. And not everyone is, let's say, a high level uh, computer programmer. So something that is happening right now is to try to simplify the access to data. Because if you want, for example, to move, to scale up from uh, Trentino to Europe, this is the number of images that you have to process. So every square here is a Sentinel-2 image, uh, image. So if you want to monitor forests, not at the regional level, but the continental scale, you will need to process tens of uh, Sentinel-2 tiles. So basically, in one year, you need, you need to process thousands and thousands of, of images. And so terabyte and terabyte, or even petabyte of, of images. So what is happening right now is that there is a lot of interest in trying to simplify the access to researcher, not only to experience, uh, let's say, programmer, but also to uh, ecology expert and so on. So there is a lot of interest from private company, so Google, Google Earth Engine. So it's basically, uh, let's say, a platform where you can develop code to access the data. Then there is uh, uh, Amazon services, and there is also the Microsoft Planetary Computer. Luckily, there is a lot of effort also from the European side with the Copernicus data space ecosystem and the themat thematic exploitation platform. These are the platform toward you can access the data, but there is also a lot of interest toward the tools with, with which you can process the data. So again, Google Earth Engine is like the, let's say, closed, not open access tools. But again, there is a lot of interest also in having open access uh, libraries and tools. So there is a lot of examples on the internet with uh, Jupyter notebooks. And then there is libraries, like say, for example, the stack library. And there is also effort in developing entire libra libraries focused on the, uh, let's say, uh, developing a set of func functionality to access the data and to process the data. Just to give you an example, uh, with Google Earth Engine, this is something that we did for the, province, uh, the forest service of the province of Trento, in which we basically uh, developed an application on Google Earth Engine, which was the cruise system, but it was the easiest one to really simplify the access to the forest service to the remote sensing data in which you develop an application for the automatic detection of bark beetle that analyzes all the images of over Trentino from uh, 2018 to, 20 to actually today. So basically, more than uh, the images that we've seen in, like, more than 2,000, more than 3,000 images probably now. And uh, it actually, it's an algorithm that analyzes the images and extracts automatically the places where it predicts that there is uh, a bark beetle attack. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. We have some questions for you. Uh, first one, how many sensors do you have around the world, like talking trees and towers, and also in Trentino specifically? Okay. Disclaimer, I am the remote sensing guy, so I'm not, I don't know a lot about the other, uh, like the numbers. I think that around Trentino, we probably have three main sites, where each site set in the order of the 30 to 40 sensor. But now there is an uh, Horizon project, which has just started, where the aim is to really finish up the, let's say, the, 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 the tree talker to have a really function, fully functioning sensor, and to place it in various areas around the world, and in very different ecosystems, because you may interact to monitor system on, in Tibet, for example, on the, in the Amazon, and so on. So the numbers there may be like in the thousands, but that is something that re it would take some time to scale up the production and to, to install them. Okay. And then, uh, which is the average preci precision of uh, satellite images? It depends what you mean by precision, because like in terms of resolution, so spatial resolution, that's what you meant. I don't know. Who okay. made the question? So in, in terms of spatial resolution, it really depends. So spatial resolution is basically the size of the pixel. You range from like the uh, continental scale sensor or even meteorological sensor, which have like three kilometers per pixel, uh, continental scale sensor, which are 250 meters per pixel, for example, MODIS, where you are not interested in very too much into the detail, but you are interested at what is happening at the national level. Then you have a like Sentinel. A Sentinel re resolution ranges from 10, 10 meters to 60 meters. You have Planet, three meter resolution. And then you have the highest uh, commercial one, which are um, at a resolution up to 20 centimeters. 
from space, but I think the limit is not only, let's say, technical, but it's also, it's also like some kind of uh, safe security limit. So there are some, like, the military have some kind of strict limit on how much you can go into detail, because obviously there are sensors that can go higher resolution, of course. but for a safety reason, they, they are not allowed from the commercial point of view. Okay. Then I have a very specific question, like, is it an Italian one? Like, per la determinazione, almeno grossolana, della salute degli alberi, è sufficiente l'NDVI index o servono informazioni spettrali più ricche? So NDVI is basically a spectral index which is computed as a, with a s very simple equation, basically a ratio between the red spectral channels and the infrared spectral channels because the difference between the two tells you an indication of how uh, rigorous the vegetation is, uh, rigoriosa, how green basically the vegetation is. And uh, the NDVI provides you one measurement but it may not be always uh, sufficient, but it also depends on which kind of sensor you're using. So if you're using a hyperspectral sensor, uh, using an NDVI will be like using uh, like a cannon to shoot a fly, okay. because you have much more spectral information. If you maybe are using a commercial sensor, which have a, a from space, where you have like four spectral channels in which you have RGB and the infrared, there uh, NDVI will be your only choice. So NDVI is very good at, t at helping you in that, especially when you start considering a time series. So you can look at the temporal trend of the, of the, of the temporal trajectories of the vegetation, so you can distinguish between, between the temporal trajectories of a healthy tree and the temporal trajectories of a tree that is not so healthy. So basically, NDVI is the same index that we use for bark beetle detection okay. in the interstellar light. Cool. And then a question related to VAIA. Um, are events like VAIA more likely to happen due to human intervention in the forest? Uh, for example, uh, wanting to have longer trees for timber production? Okay, so there is actually some, uh, quite a lot of research trying to understand how a forest management practice actually may favor or not favor such kind of events. Some may expect that if uh, humans handle, uh, like for example, wildfires by uh, uh, like turning spinner in changes, I don't know, I don't remember, they uh, put, out, uh, put out fires, you may say that's a good thing and it is actually a good thing, but if you do it too much, you may risk to try to, uh, the vegetation in the forest will change and then you have more favorable condition for other wildfires. And uh, or maybe, for example, if you start planting trees that are not specifically to the ecosystem in which you are, they may get uh, six to more easily. So for example, it may be more easy to attack them with uh, an insect and so on. I don't think that the specific of like leaving trees more to go more higher, that they, 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 they will get more susceptible, susceptible to some kind of like windstorm. But there is actually proof that the forest management practice actually may make forest less resilient to, to disturbances. Okay, then the last question. Uh, do you have a plot of some variable evolving over the last 20 years? Sorry? Uh, do you have a plot of some variables evolving over the last 20 years, like historical data about y some <laughs> measurement? Uh, yes, like I, I, I've been in FEM for two years, so that's not, uh, I'm not the best person to ask it. Uh, but there are like some of the towers that you've seen have been up for like more than 20 years. Uh, three talkers have been up for probably in some areas for like five to six years. And uh, then in terms of like remote sensing data, you, we have like Landsat that has images from the 70s. So uh, over probably, I think that at least over Europe, you have like at least one annual image every year. So if you go on Google time lapse, Google Earth time lapse, you can see the time lapse over the entire Europe from the over the entire world actually, from 1984 to today. So you have a, we have quite a lot of historical data, and actually there are a lot of networks uh, of research centers around the world that freely provide data from the 90s, from the 80s. So it depends on what you need, obviously. Okay. So a big applause to Daniele. <laughs> if you have Thank more you. questions, uh, you can ask him anything after with a beer. So last few things, we are at the end of the event. And so please read it carefully. Uh, we have specific instructions for you. So the green chairs go down there, where is France. The 
red ones go there in the corner. The mixed color one, like the orange and the black one, go at the entrance. And the black one, like the biggest one, goes next to, ah, goes there in the corner behind the shelves. Okay. So I think that's it. Now, beers and specs. So thank you, everybody.